One of America's most beloved comedians, Lucille Ball was an American actress and pioneer in comedy. As an entertainer and businesswoman, Ball continuously broke barriers for women in the entertainment business. Lucille Ball got her start as a singer, model and film star before becoming one of America's top comedic actresses with the 1950s TV show I Love Lucy, co-starring on the show with her husband Desi Arnaz. The two divorced in 1960 and Ball went on to star in The Lucy Show and Here's Lucy while also becoming a top TV executive. Paul was born on August the 6th, 1911 in Jamestown, New York to Henry Durrell Ball and his wife Desiree. The elder of the couple's two children, her brother Fred, was born in 1915. Ball had a tough childhood shaped by tragedy and a lack of money. Ball's father Henry, or Had as he was known to his family, was an electrician and not long after his daughter's birth, he relocated the family to Montana for work. Then it was off to Michigan, where Had took a job as a telephone lineman with the Michigan Bell Company. Life came undone in February 1915, though, when Had was struck with typhoid fever and died. For Ball, just three years old at the time, her father's death not only set in motion a series of difficult childhood hurdles, but also served as the young girl's first real significant memory. I do remember everything that happened, she said, hanging out the window, begging to play with the kids next door who had measles, the doctor coming, my mother weeping. I remember a bird that flew in the window, a picture that fell off the wall. Desiree, still reeling from her husband's unexpected death and pregnant with Fred, packed up and returned to Jamestown, New York, where she eventually found work in a factory and a new husband, Ed Peterson. Peterson, though, wasn't a fan of kids, especially young ones, and with Desiree's blessing, he decided the two of them would move to Detroit without her children. Fred moved in with Desiree's parents, while Ball was forced to make a new home with Ed's folks. For Ball, that meant contending with Peterson's stern mother, who didn't have much money to lavish on her step-granddaughter. The family, Ball would later recall, lacked enough money even for school pencils. Finally, at age 11, Ball reunited with her mother when Desiree and Ed returned to Jamestown. Even then, Ball had an itch to do something big, and when she was 15, she convinced her mother to allow her to enroll in a New York City drama school. But despite her longing to make it on the stage, Ball was too nervous to draw much notice. I was a tongue-tied teenager, spellbound by the school's star pupil, Betty Davis, said Ball. The school finally wrote her mother, Lucy's wasting her time and ours. She's too shy and reticent to put her best foot forward. She remained in New York, however, and by 1927, Ball, who had started calling herself Diane Belmont, found work as a model, first for fashion designer Hattie Carnegie, and then, after overcoming a debilitating bout of rheumatoid arthritis, for Chesterfield cigarettes. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. In the early 1930s, Ball, who had dyed her chestnut hair blonde, moved to Hollywood to seek out more acting opportunities. Work soon followed, including a stint as one of the 12 Goldwyn Girls to promote the 1933 Eddie Cantor flick Roman Scandals. She landed a role as an extra in the Ritz Brothers film The Three Musketeers and in 1937 earned a sizable part in Stage Door, starring Catherine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers. All told, Ball would appear in 72 movies during her long career, including a string of second-tier films in the 1940s that garnered her the unofficial title, The Queen of B-Movies. One of the earliest ones, a movie called Dance Girl Dance, introduced her to a handsome Cuban band leader named Desi Arnaz. The two appeared together in Ball's next film, Too Many Girls, and before the year was out, the pair fell madly in love and married. 
for the careful, career-minded Ball who had periodically been romantically linked to a series of older men, Arnaz was something completely different. Fiery and young, he was just 23 when they met and with a bit of a reputation as a ladies' man. Friends and colleagues guessed the romance between the apparently mismatched entertainers wouldn't last a year. But Ball seemed drawn to Arnaz's spark and while her husband's attention sometimes did stray romantically from the marriage, the truth is that during their 20 years together, Arnaz greatly supported Ball's career hopes. Still, as the late 1940s rolled around, Ball, who had dyed her hair red in 1942 at MGM's urging, was looking at a stagnant movie career. Unable to break into the kinds of starring roles she had always dreamed about. As a result, Arnaz pushed his wife to try broadcasting, and it wasn't long before Ball landed a lead part in the radio comedy My Favourite Husband. The program caught the attention of CBS executives who wanted her to recreate something like it on the small screen. Ball, though, insisted it include her real-life husband, something the network clearly wasn't interested in seeing happen. So Ball walked away and with Desi put together an I Love Lucy like vaudeville act and took it on the road. Success soon greeted the pair and so did a contract from CBS. From the get-go, Ball and Arnaz knew exactly what they wanted from the network. Their demands included the opportunity to create their new program in Hollywood rather than New York, where most TV was still being shot. But the biggest hurdle centered on the couple's preference to shoot on film rather than the less expensive kinescope. When CBS told them it would cost too much, Ball and Arnaz agreed to take a pay cut. In return, they would retain full ownership rights to the program and run it under their newly formed production company, Desilu Productions. It was I Love Lucy, which premiered on CBS on October 15th, 1951, that earned Lucille Ball her niche in television history. The 30-minute comedy starred Miss Ball and the Cuban-born Arnaz as the wacky Lucy, Ricardo, and her conga-playing husband Ricky. The show was a weekly dash into absurdity that boasted the biggest television audience of its time, of almost any time. It was immediately apparent that this was a sitcom like no other. Bombastic and daring, the show, which co-starred Vivian Vance and William Frawley as Lucy and Desi's two best friends, set the stage for a generation of family-related sitcoms to come. The program included storylines that dealt with marital issues, women in the workplace, and suburban living. And in perhaps one of the most memorable TV episodes ever, I Love Lucy touched on the theme of pregnancy when Lucy gave birth to little Ricky on January the 19th, 1953. The same day the real-life Lucy delivered her son, Desi Jr., by caesarean. Ball and Arnaz's first child, Lucy, had arrived two years earlier. As the title of the show indicated, Lucy was the star. While she could at times downplay her hard work, Ball was a perfectionist. Contrary to perception, rarely was anything ad-libbed. It was routine for the actress to spend hours rehearsing her antics and facial expressions. And her groundbreaking work in comedy paved the way for future stars such as Mary Tyler Moore, Penny Marshall, Sybil Shepherd, and even Robin Williams. Her genius did not go unrecognized. During its six-year run, I Love Lucy's success was unmatched. For four of its seasons, the sitcom was the number one show in the country. In 1953, the program captured an unheard of 67.3 audience share, which included a 71.1 rating for the episode that featured Little Ricky's birth, a turnout that surpassed the television audience for President Eisenhower's inauguration ceremonies. While the show ended in 1957, Desi Lu Productions continued on, producing more television hits like Our Miss Brooks, Make Room for Daddy, The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Untouchables, Star Trek, 
and Mission Impossible. In 1960, Ball and Arnaz divorced. Two years later, Ball, now remarried to comedian Gary Morton, bought out her former husband and took over Desilu Productions, making her the first woman to run a major television production studio. She eventually sold the company to Gulf Western in 1967 for $17 million. More acting work followed, including a pair of sitcoms, The Lucy Show, from 1962 to 68, and also Here's Lucy, from 1968 until 1973. Both achieved a modest level of success, but neither captured the magic that had defined her earlier program with Arnaz. It didn't matter though, even if she had never done another piece of acting again, Ball's impact on the world of comedy and the television industry in general would have been widely recognized. In 1971, she became the first woman to receive the International Radio and Television Society's gold medal. In addition, there were four Emmys, induction into the Television Hall of Fame, and recognition for her life's work from the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. In 1985, Ball strayed from her comedic background to take on a dramatic role as a homeless woman in the made-for-TV movie Stone Pillow. While it was hardly a smash hit, Ball earned some praise for her performance. Most critics, though, wanted to see her return to comedy, and in 1986, she debuted a new CBS sitcom, Life with Lucy. The program earned its star $2.3 million, but not much of an audience. After just eight episodes, it was cancelled. On April the 26th, 1989, Lucille Ball passed away at the age of 77 at the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles due to a ruptured abdominal aorta. At the time, she was recovering from emergency heart surgery. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favorite Lucille Ball movie or TV episode that you like the most or perhaps a moment in her career that makes you laugh the most? Let us know in the comments below and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.